I recently added a DRO to my lathe, and today I'd like to make a few more tool holders. Now, the DRO I bought, which we'll see in a minute, has a 200 tool library. And I only have 194 tools. We've already made tool holders here before. The same exact holders we'll be making today, except I did those on the shaper, which I don't have anymore. This project will do on the milling machine. In fact, I've had this chunk of material around ever since that first tool holders video. Except, I'm pretty sure this isn't the same stuff. I have no idea what this is, but it's tough as all get out. And I don't think you need me telling you how tough all get out is. I did, of course, try to one inch punch it, but I barely managed to knock a chip off. We'll see how it goes this time. Welcome to the future. Welcome. To the year 2000. This is a DRO, or digital readout, not to be confused with a differential ring oscillator, a dynamic range optimizer, or a dielectric resonance orbiter for that matter, all of which my lathe already had, obviously. This happens to be a Sino, Sino, whatever, SDS6 two axis readout. I can't say for sure, but I'm willing to bet all of the import DROs in this price range are more or less the same. Everything is already installed. This is not a DRO install video. I debated the whole time whether to even make this video at all, and by the time I decided that I would, well, I'd finish the install. To maybe state the obvious, the whole point of a digital readout is to give you constant positional feedback about where your tool is in relation to your work. I mean, you still need your micrometers and your slide rules to make good parts, but this speeds everything up, not having to keep track of how many turns you're making on the hand wheel, that sort of thing. You can get a lot closer to finished dimension faster than you likely could without one, though honestly, I don't know why you're always in such a rush. So I'm telling you this for a couple of reasons. First, I like you. And second, I want to set the stage for why we're doing what we're doing today. That said, a DRO works great as long as nothing changes. Again, we're trying to keep track of the position between your work and the cutting tool. If, for example, your work slips in the chuck while you're working, it's game over. You have to start again. If for some reason you loosen your tool post and relocate your tool, Swing your top slide because you want to cut a chamfer, that's not going to play nice with the DRO, if you want to take full advantage of what the DRO does. There's other ways to use it, we'll get to that in a second. However, if you just change to a different tool, which, you know, on a lathe tends to happen a lot, it's almost game over, but not necessarily. See, if your work slips or your tool moves, you really have no way of knowing its new position. No way to really tell the DRO how bad you just messed up. But with quick change tool holders, you can, in theory, know the difference in position between one tool holder and the other. If you measured it, you could know that tool two is, say, half an inch away and half inch back from tool one. If you can tell that information to the DRO, tell the DRO you've changed to a different tool and that it's in a different position, well, in the infamous words of Blind Boy Fuller, you can just keep on trucking. In addition to making more holders, we'll look at programming the tool library, so tool changes are easy. The procedure is almost certainly different between different makes and models of DRO, but the underlying principle is all the same. In particular, on this one, we'll be looking at the call and tool buttons. I'm sure we all know what HA does. <laughs> Like I mentioned, you don't have to do this. You don't need to use the tool library. You can just zero each new tool in the DRO as you install it. That works totally fine. But I'd like to give this a try, see if it fits my style. Except when it isn't, first things first. I'm going to clean up this burning hunk of love. I don't think there's much of anything clever I can add here, so I'll just give you the play-by-play -play as we play. This piece of raw stock is pushing the capacity of the machine. I think I can just pull this off. I'm in the two-piece split vise. I can't come in from off the work, so I'm just going to slowly adjust the cut depth as it's traversing. I think I'll do the top and cut in the dovetails, and then take it from there. You may be wondering to yourself why I waited so long to install one of these. Or you might not be. I mean, what do I know? Two reasons. First, a DRO on a lathe never struck me as indispensable as a DRO on the mill. Meaning I've never found myself working on the lathe and wishing it had one. In fact, I've worked on lathes with DROs and completely ignored them. I still just use the dials. Compare that to milling, where I have a specific clause in my contract stating I will not work on a mill without a DRO. Call me a drama queen if you want, but I just won't. End of story, it's 2019 for crying out loud. But that said, all the people at my weekly Machinist Anonymous group tell me that I'll feel the same way once I get used to a DRO on the lathe. Time will tell, I suppose. 
Second, the Colchester student, which is the lathe that I have, is notorious for having very little carriage space for a scale. Very little space to work with for at least a standard scale. That, more than anything else, slowed down this upgrade. By the way, on a lathe, this is usually the X direction. Eh, what the hey, since we're all standing here anyway. On a machine tool, the convention is that the z-axis is always along the spindle center line. And on a lathe, it's positive moving away from the chuck. I mean, it doesn't really matter, I guess, and perhaps you're the type to fly in the face of convention. But direction aside, z is the machine spindle. Google right-hand rule and you'll see a picture of how to figure it out on your own. And I know what you're wondering. What if you don't have a right hand? Well, you can use your left hand. Just bend your middle finger 90 degrees backwards. Not gonna lie, when this two-piece vise let go of this work, I soiled myself just a little bit. You didn't see the left-hand side, but what it did was push the fixed jaw out and away and the whole workpiece just sort of followed the end mill back. That's a three-quarter inch, four-flute roughing end mill, going I think about 340, 350 RPM, and a little bit more than two inches a minute, with a step over of three-eighths of an inch. So the cutting forces were pretty high. Not to mention it wasn't the sharpest end mill I had. I put in a sharper end mill, squared up the two-piece vise, and used some big strap clamps. That seems to have done it, as this side is roughed out. I promised the play-by-play, -play, so that's what I'm gonna do. I've been thinking about how to get to this other side. Obviously, I've gotta move the strap clamps. I thought about rotating the work, just so I'm not working with as much Y-axis overhead hang to get to this side, but I'm going to have to do that switch up a few times between roughing, finishing, and then the dovetail cut. When it dawned on me, I have a bigger vise. I have the vertex on the CNC router. So before I get too far, I think I'm going to break this down and try to use that vise. That'll let me do all of the operations on this side without changing the setup, hopefully keep everything nice, square, and parallel. Looks like it's in there nice and solid. The dovetail hasn't bottomed out. I didn't expect it to, but you're never quite sure until you try. Let me back up a minute. This is a sliding dovetail tool post. This side of the dovetail is fixed, built right into the tool post. And this part of the dovetail that you see on this angle can slide up and down. So that's as open as it'll go. And as I tighten the screw on the top, the dovetail slides down, making this fit tighter. It squeezes onto the tool holders and drives them back up against these two faces. So although I did match the dovetail on my new tool holders to an existing factory tool holder, there is a little bit of wiggle room. If you overcut it and it's a little too thin, this still has room to potentially bite onto it. I have made one or two where I've gotten a little sloppy. The dovetail was a smidge undersized. And so by the time this sliding dovetail bottomed out, it still wasn't tight on the tool. So those were scrap tool holders. Anyway, back to what we were doing. I finished the dovetail. I cut it down to size. Sorry I didn't show you all of that. Those little dovetail cutters are quite delicate and I was only really moving my way in about 30, 40 thou at a time, a millimeter tops. A bunch of measuring over some gauge pins and some finish passes and I don't know, it wasn't all that exciting. If you wanna see that, again, you can go back to the other tool holders video. Next, I need to figure out how to cut this into four, maybe five tool holders. I'm not even putting a dent in this thing. I'm afraid there's only one last thing to try. So you, can you win! Perfect! Problem with unleashing this sort of power, as I'm sure you're all aware, are the ensuing continuity errors. Nothing too exciting happened here. You sort of saw me cut the dovetails in. I then finished squaring up each block. I cut, I mean punched, the large slot where the tool would sit. 
Drilled a few holes, haven't even tapped the threads in yet. Some non-critical relief cuts specific to these two holders and a whole truckload of chamfers. So many chamfers, in fact, that I've run out. In my head, I planned to do the tool library programming with new tool holders, but I didn't check if I actually had hardware to finish these, which I don't. Let's head over to the DRO, look at the tool offset programming, and then we'll come back a little bit later and chat about a couple of details in these tool holders that might be of interest. You should be aware that English isn't this thing's first language. Although ALE is always an excellent recommendation, that's not what the DRO is telling you. ALE stands for absolute. Now I do realize they probably don't teach this outright in school, but when it comes to abbreviations, you can't just randomly pull out three letters from the word you hope to shorten. Exhibit B, CTR, is their abbreviation for calculator. The SINPO DRO on my mill isn't a ton better, but at least they got absolute and calculator right. When these things boot up, they start in absolute mode. That's its top level reference. If I zero it out here, that's the zero reference that the DRO will use for everything. So if I move the lathe tool, I'm now 5.5 something inches away from where I zeroed the absolute coordinate system. That's not five and a half inches away from the work, five and a half inches from the chuck, just from where I zeroed it. So you can think of it like a soft reference, I guess. Hold on, how do I explain this without confusing everybody? These scales are not absolute, not like the way they might be on your digital calipers. This Mitotoyo says absolute right there. This thing is currently off. If I move it to some position and I turn it on, it knows where it is. Again, I can turn it off, move it, turn it back on, and it still knows where it is. It's absolute. This DRO, however, or these scales are not absolute. So if it's powered off and I move the tool like a madman, when I turn it back on, it's not going to know that the tool moved. It's going to tell me I'm in the same position I was last time. It basically wakes back up with whatever the last value was in the DRO. Now you can get absolute scales for a DRO system. If you want to go check the price on those, I recommend you sit down and have your doctor sedate you ahead of time. So let's say we're on the face of our part on the axis of the machine and we can zero in the absolute coordinate system. This will keep track of the position of that first tool. Now you also have an incremental mode. If you push up, the display changes to incremental. And again, you can zero this out as you see fit. If you own or use digital calipers, I'm sure you use this feature all the time, bouncing between absolute and incremental. If you don't, well, incremental does exactly what it sounds like. It keeps track of movements in relation to whatever your last position was. In this case, we were going from zero, zero, so there's no difference. But if in absolute, if I move two inches in each direction, and I go to incremental, I can zero out here and now move with respect to those two inches. So in this case, I'm half an inch out and half an inch away from my base two inch mark. If I jump back to absolute, that should say two and a half and two and a half. In addition to absolute and incremental, you also have access on DROs to what they call subdatums, or on this particular version, they call them zeros. Zero one, zero two, zero three, it goes up to 200. In order to better explain this incremental and the 200 subdatums, or the 200 zeros in this case, let's go take a look at it over in the mill because I think that's probably a little more intuitive than it is on the lathe. I ask you to please use your imagination, make pretend this thing is nice and clean. And as you can see, we're set up with a vise and a drill. For argument's sake, we need to make a part with a bunch of holes in it. Let's say one bolt hole pattern on the left and one bolt hole pattern on the right. To keep this simple, we'll just talk about the X dimension. And our origin would be the back left hand corner. So that's zero. That's where we zero the DRO in absolute coordinates. We've got a print and say the first hole pattern, the center of that hole pattern is five whatever away from the left hand side. The center of the next hole pattern is 10 units away from that one. So it's 15 away from the edge. And let's assume all the holes are two units away from their respective centers. So you could do this all in absolute mode. Zero your tool on the left hand side, then just do the math. Come over to three, drill that hole. Over to five, drill those two holes. Over to seven, get your calculator out, keep doing the math. Now you've got to go over to 13, 15 and 17. That's totally legit. Sometimes it depends on how the print was delivered to you, what kind of dimensioning system they used. Alternatively, you could go to that center position at five, go into incremental mode, zero out, and just make moves in units of two. So now you're just working between plus two and minus two. From that center, you could just move over 10 units, zero your incremental again, and again work in units of two, or whatever your print might happen to be. I find it keeps me from making mistakes. When you're expecting to see only twos and negative twos on the DRO, well, it's a red flag if you see a three. Again, this example is pretty basic, but hopefully it illustrates what incremental is good for.
Now let's assume you have a second vise, or maybe you have a fixture plate with a lot of locations, and you want to set it up with two or more parts. This maybe happens more in CNC, but you know, it's totally legit in manual machining too. You could set up your DRO so one vise is in the absolute coordinate system, and the other one is in the incremental. Say the one on the left, we use that back left corner in absolute coordinate system, we zero that out, find it with an edge finder. When we're on zero there, we switch into incremental and find the zero on the vise on the right. Then you can make your part in the absolute coordinate system on the left, simply switch to incremental, move over to the vise on the right, and make your second part. It's like having two DROs. Now, although that's totally legit, you've sort of used up your easy to get to coordinate system your incremental. If you have incremental features on your first part, you can't really switch to the incremental mode because we're using that for the other vise. You'd have to figure out all the moves with your calculator. What you might do instead is set up subdatums. Subdatums are exactly the same as the absolute and the incremental coordinate systems. Store the origin of one vise in subdatum one and the origin of the other vise in subdatum two, and then you can switch back and forth all you like. And within those subdatums, you still have access to your incremental mode. Now, maybe you don't use two vices or a fixture plate. You're a simple person with simple needs. You can use those subdatums all on one vise. You could zero out to one side of your jaw and call this subdatum one, and call the other one subdatum two. So if you have parts you use, say, a vice stop for, if you use it on the left, work in subdatum one. If you use it on the right, work in subdatum two. Once you've programmed those in and wrote those down somewhere, well, it saves you a ton of time of having to get your edge finder out and pick those origins up again every time you make those parts. Holy smokes, we sure did a lot of talking there. Bottom line, absolute, incremental, and all 200 subdatums are pretty much the same exact thing. Again, think of them as 202 different DROs attached to your machine without all the hassle of 600 extra cables. And you know, come to think of it, you could add a DRO to anything you want. Doesn't doesn't have to be a mill or a lathe. I have one on my bandsaw fence, both my bench vices, all of my toolboxes, and one of my hand files. Now if your mind isn't already blown, this next bit might do it. On top of ABS, incremental, and the 200 subdatums, this has an additional 200 offsets for tools. That's like 402 coordinate systems. Again, it's really all the same thing, just different names. Though technically a subdatum moves your work to a different place without changing your tool location, and a tool offset changes your tool location without moving your work. But just like everything else in life, it's a matter of perspective. You can, if you want, use your subdatums as your tool library. It would totally work the same. Instead of calling up a tool using the call button, you just switch to the subdatum, or the zero in this case, that you've set up for that tool. To get into the tool offsets, into the tool library of this DRO, you have to open the tool room. On this one, you press the decimal point 10 times in a row. The plus minus button 10 times in a row. That's tool library closed. Can't add or edit any tools now. Tool library open. What we're gonna do next is measure the difference in positions between each one of these three tools. So later we can input that into the tool offsets in the DRO. I'm going to do just these three for now, and I've labeled them one, two, and three. You would of course have to do this for all of your lathe tools. I have an indicator set up. It's on tool center line. Hopefully all of your tools are already on center line. It's probably smarter to use an indicator with one of those flat tips on it, one of those big disc tips, but I don't have one. So I'm just gonna be careful with this one. Now because we have to do this in two directions, X and Z, we're gonna have to do this measurement twice for each tool. One in this direction, and then we'll flip the indicator 90 degrees around and do it in the Z direction. This for argument's sake is tool one. I'm just gonna bring it in until the indicator reads zero. Now I'm gonna zero the DRO in absolute mode, and I'm gonna write that down. Tool one is zero in X. Then I'm gonna to switch to tool two. Do the same thing. When the indicator reads zero, I'll read the number off the X dimension on the DRO and write it down. I'll do the same thing for tool three, move in until my indicator reads zero, and then write down that DRO reading. Actual indicator isn't moving in space. We're using that zero position as sort of our absolute reference, and we're using the DRO to tell us how far each tool is away from that. Now I'll do the same exact thing in Z. Go back to tool one, come in until we're on zero. This is a tense indicator, so it's quite finicky and then zero out the Z direction. Again, we're still in absolute. I'll write that number down, switch to tool three. Take the indicator to zero, read the number on the DRO, write it down in my little tool table. And there are tool measurements. Tool one is zero in X and zero in Z by definition. That's where we zeroed out the DRO and took all our other measurements from. 
Notice the values for tool 2 and tool 3 in the X direction I've cut in half. That's because this DRL on the lathe is set for diameter mode. The X dimension is measuring diameter, which means the measurement that we took against the indicator is actually doubled. So I had to cut that in half. If that doesn't make sense to you, don't take this the wrong way, but maybe you shouldn't be worrying about tool libraries just yet. Now the tool library is open. I'm going to go to tool 1 and just zero that out. I don't think that's necessary, but better safe than sorry. Now I'll go to tool 2 and enter those values in X and Y. 0.2147. I want you to notice something when I hit enter. It turned into 4.3. And I'll do Y. It was 0.0222. Enter. And it changed to 2.18. Let's do tool 3 and we'll talk about why I think that happens in just a moment. Tool, tool 3. X is 0.2. 2679, hit enter, it turned into 2673, and y is 3,000 some change, 0 0.0033, enter. Again, switch to 29. Now that's happening for two reasons, I think. First, you can't enter any old number. The number on the DRO has to be some multiple of the 5 micron scale I have installed on the lathe. So the number will jump to whatever the closest division is on the scale, or that it can handle, I guess. Second, I'm getting the feeling that this DRO likes to work in metric. So when you switch between metric and inch mode, it's still thinking in metric, but it's doing a conversion before you see it on the display. And when you enter data into the keypad in inches, I think it's converting it back to metric, matching it to the resolution of the scales, and then converting it back to inches. That's why I think we get these weird jumps. Anyway, we can leave the tool library. From absolute, I can now call up tools. So I can call tool one, hit enter, and that's zero. If I call tool two, hit enter, that's the difference in position between tool one and tool two. If I call tool three, that is the position of tool three with respect to tool one. So let's see if I could try this out. We'll go call up tool one again. I'll make sure to install tool one and we'll take a skim cut. I'll measure that. And that's 1882. In absolute, I'm going to input that. X is 1.8820. Enter. See, it did it again. I don't know if I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. So in theory, the DRO is now tracking the diameter of the work. If I don't change tools, I can keep working, say so turn that down to one and a half inch, 1.5 triple zero, and the part should be one and a half inch diameter. But what I'm going to do is switch to a second tool. I'm going to call up tool two, hit enter. You see we're not at 1882 anymore because tool two is in a different position. I'll change to tool two, turn the handwheel back until we're at 1882 again. I think it was 1882. And now when we come in with tool two, we should just be scratching the work. We're taking a spring pass. We're not touching it at all. I know it's pretty close, but it should be right on. I measure that with the DRO until the tool just bottoms out. Wow, a 40 thou error, one millimeter. So that should have said 1882. Instead, like I mentioned, I'm losing 40 thou. Now, I'm not saying that's the DRO. I could have likely been a bit more careful in zeroing out all of my tools, or maybe my tools aren't as close to center height as I thought they were. But certainly some of that conversion error is biting me there. So I'm gonna do all of this again, double check all the tool heights, and then do this in metric. And I think that's all I got for now for this DRO. As you can see, I'm still getting to know it. The abbreviations are gonna take a little getting used to. I have to get a better feel for the metric inch conversion that it's doing. I don't like that the DRO isn't live in the tool library. For example, what I'd expect is if I go into tool four, for example, where I have nothing to find, in this tool definition stage, if I move the machine, I'm moving my carriage and I'm moving my cross slide, the DRO isn't live. It's waiting for an input. And that's why I had to measure in absolute mode using the indicator. It would have been so much easier if I could just take a cut with tool four, measure that diameter and input it here. And you know, it could do all that clockwork math on the inside and figure out the difference between tool four and tool three and tool one, etc. Other than that, it seems to be doing okay. No weird glitches. The buttons feel on par with the other import DROs. I'll keep you posted. Before I wrap this up, I promised you a few more thoughts on the tool holder, so let's head back to the bench. Recently, there's been some controversy in the comments to how Meatball was doing. I don't know if you can make it out, but she's living up to her name. In fact, she's eating us out of house and home. She's a tough act to follow, but let's have a look at these tool holders. Now, arguably the only important dimensions here are the size of the dovetail, so it actually locks into the tool post, 
and the bottom of this slot where the tool is clamped into. That bottom surface should be as perpendicular to those dovetails as possible. More so, I suppose, for insert tooling, but you know, you probably want your high-speed steel in there straight too. Now, those two critical features are on two opposite sides with no easy way to indicate between one and the other. So naturally, I think you'd want to clamp this in your vise. Hold on, let me grab a vise. Imagine for a second this is my mill vise. It'll make me go dragging my whole milling machine over here. I'm going to guess the tendency is probably to clamp the tool holder in like this. Most mills have an X direction power feed, so you'd come in with your end mill and hog that out. Problem is, you don't know if this surface is going to be perpendicular to those dovetails. Now, they could be if you took care in the intermediate step between milling those dovetails and squaring up this entire block. But if you have a one thou error in your setup, by the time you get to this feature, that might be three thou out, two thou out. So instead, what I prefer to do with these is reference the dovetails. Here I've got a pair of dowel pins. I can tuck those into the dovetails and clamp those in my vise. We can do this without dropping them. Now if my vise is mounted this way on the milling machine and it's indicated into the travel, that slot will be perfectly perpendicular to the dovetails, or as perpendicular as my setup is. Now if I get the bugs worked out of the tool library on that DRO, I plan to grind in all of the tool holders that I've made, which is quite a few of them. And this is probably how I hold it on the grinder, referencing the dovetails, installing the vise parallel to the motion of the machine, and grinding that back surface, or that bottom surface. That surface being true and square to the dovetails will ensure that all your insert tooling is set up correctly for the clearance and rake angles that it's designed for. So if that bottom surface is wonky, your insert geometry might be too. You know, it might be tipped a few degrees one way or the other, up or down. Other than that, there isn't too much to these tool holders. It'd be nice if they were hardened, I suppose, but I'll be sure to share them with you again when they're finished. I think that's all Meatball and me got for today. Thanks for watching.